Hello, Matt Domon. I am so excited to have you on the Tech Fun and Techies podcast. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Sophia. I'm excited to be here. So I read your article on why digital transformations go wrong. And this is really where I wanted to start. And then I want to dive into what really happened when you were creating AWS, because obviously AWS is huge. But this whole digital transformation thing, it's really been on my mind because digital transformation has been going on for ages. Like it's not a new thing. You and I have not just created it. Companies have spent billions of dollars on this. And, you know, according to McKinsey, 70% of them go wrong, like a digital transformation project. I always think of them like a house renovation. It's always expensive, it's always over budget, something always goes wrong, and then you end up hating the builders. I mean, that's usually... Okay, that's one way to look at it. <laughs> and um, so you wrote in your article that generally digital transformations, they kind of focus outward rather than inward, and that's where some of the problems lie. Did I understand that correctly? Uh, I think it's a little bit of both. You have, you have to focus on both, actually. Mm -hmm. So you have to focus on externally on your customers and the market and what they need and how they interact with you and internally on your employees, your business processes and how you interact and serve customers. And they're, they're dovetailed. You have to do both. So what? let's just go back to basics. What is digital transformation? Well, okay. In the new world that we live in, customers want what they want, how they want it, where they want it, and when they want it. Mm -hmm. And the pandemic that we just went through even accelerated that, that demand. We all live like we're doing today on Zoom, or we live through our browsers, or you know things are focused on convenience to deliver to the home many organizations haven't been set up to accommodate those demands. Mm -hmm. And so the, the companies have to, and, and organizations in general, nonprofits, whatever, um, they have to transition to accommodate market changes in the new world. And so that's kind of the essence of digital transformation. It's not like, hey, I'm going to launch this cool new mobile app or hey, you know, I have to move to cloud, you know, those are means to an end and they may be important to what you're trying to accomplish, but that's not the true essence of going digital. So basically, I'll just kind of give a, an example. Literally, I, I did say, so I'm currently in the south of France, which I really, really love, but I think everybody knows uh, that French trains and French train services, like once you get on the train, the train services are amazing the kind of buying tickets and dealing with train stations. I think it's the same system they've had since like the 18th century. I'm pretty sure. Exactly. <laughs> and, um, but you know, they've got unions and all, all of that. Anyway, and um, what I would ideally like to do is what I do when I'm in New York or in London, which is you go online or you open your train app, you select your train and then you get a ticket and then that's it. Not in France. In France, you've got a go to the station, you've got to line up, you've got to go through the options and all of that. So is that kind of a, a rough example of what you're talking about? Consumers want one thing and organizations are kind of still doing whatever they used to do. I mean, that's a great example and it's a core, it's a core uh, way. I mean, the way that the customers, I mean, it's got to be oriented towards the customer. So customers want it to be simple, they want it to be easy, and they want it to be frictionless. That's the experience that you're describing that you would like. Uh, and yet the organization isn't making that available to their customers, which creates a frustrating experience. And so that is a digital transformation. What you pointed out successfully was done well. What you've pointed out with the French train experience is one where you may want to start and, and move into doing it. But here we can actually look at the economic circumstances because, you know, trains, trains in France, it's a monopoly. And also generally with trains, like in Britain, there was this deregulation and there were definitely good bits about that, but then also terrible bits about that. But So essentially there are some 
um, sectors that are either natural monopolies or, or monopolized. And then because there is less competition, like I have to go to Cannes, I have no choice. Um, so essentially, when there is no choice, you don't have to change. So there, there are no economic imperatives. But it, so there is that option. But also, I wonder if in companies that are, that have a higher switching cost, is there lower digital transformation imperatives? Like, for example, you know, uh, consumer products, like I don't know, consumer consumer streaming services or consumer meditation apps. It all has to be super super seamless and super easy because you can switch from headspace to calm literally in like two minutes. But enterprise software, that's a much longer sales cycle. If you're a frustrated employee, you're kind of stuck with whatever your boss's boss 15 years ago signed. Sure. So am I right in assuming that in the B2B space and in monopolies, digital transformation is behind? Uh, I'd say monopolies for sure. I mean, it, it's hard to paint a broad brush over an entire thing, right? Some mm -hmm. some have made the, the the transformation, and others haven't. I will say though, with B two B, it's starting to change, and and why there's a there's a constant drumbeat of new applications. I mean, we could look at sales optimization around Salesforce, for example. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different applications coming up to streamline the sales process uh, and make it easier uh, for sales reps to do uh, their work, right? Um, and Salesforce has traditionally owned that. And now there are many different competing, smaller, more uh, vertically oriented solutions that are better than Salesforce or make Salesforce better. That that's an example. So some are happening in B two B, some aren't. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the in terms of your switching costs, that that's there, no question. Um, but in the world where people where customers are demanding a more simple, easy, and frictionless experience, even the more st standard or more established firms are going to have to respond because upstarts will take over uh, or customers won't renew or they may may stay with you but won't invest as much as they should. Mm -hmm. And there's not a board out there that's not going to pressure a B2B software company to increase ARR. So, so you know, I'm thinking about the British banking sector, and I think it's kind of similar in the US. So there are the newer banks that are essentially a digital first bank. So I'm thinking Revolut, and I'm a very happy Revolut customer, and they're also in the US now. And this stuff just works. So I use it for my business and I use it for my personal stuff. It works. The apps are really, really good. Um, I'm also a big fan of Nikolai Sorosky, the CEO. He, he's good looking. And he, <laughs> and he's smart. That's always a plus. So, so, you know, if the CEO is good looking, that's that's usually a selling point. For me. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so the thing is, the product is genuinely good. Um, and then I look at the banks that I used to use, and it's terrible. It's they're they're really really bad. The user experience is terrible. Communicating with them is terrible. The entire experience is terrible. And yet they haven't gone out of business. Lloyds and NetWest in the UK still exist. I'm not sure about kind of what the customer experience is like in specific US banks, but from what I'm hearing, it is pretty similar. So how does that work? If something is basically brilliant and, and its competitor is absolutely terrible, why does the terrible thing survive? Well, in the case that you have and in the current economic climate that we have, there's fewer and fewer options. Actually, it's that's a good point. There have been a few bank collapses recently, yes. It's hard to build a bank it is and hard to build handle that. everything that goes with the fraud. That's why right. if you're good-looking and you've built a bank, you're really sexy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You're you, lie you, if you're you got it made. This, hi. You're going to go down to Marbella and have a good time. Uh, it, yeah, so they're entrenched and there's fewer options to choose from, right? So... Mm -hmm. However, look at what you described with Revolut. Mm -hmm. um, you are starting to pull things you would normally do from a wire transfer out, out of the bank. And banks make a mm -hmm. fair amount of money on wire transfers. That's the mm -hmm. charge. Mm -hmm. So 
you know, that's the first the first wave of of some of the things that would happen to pull what you'd normally do with them away. Mm -hmm. And so if you were advising the chief executive of, say, one of these older banks and, you know, they, they've got some money to spend and they they do have some problem with with digital transformation. Um, what are the kind of top things that you would say to them? Because I hear some people say, oh, it's all about the systems. You've got to upgrade the systems. I talk to the CTO. Other people are saying you haven't upgraded your team. This is why you've got this problem. Kind of, is there something else? And where are you on those camps? Uh, okay. First off, I wouldn't start with tech or team at all. Interesting. Uh, there are two, two silos, and we talked about it at the beginning of the discussion. One's the customer. Mm -hmm. Work backwards from the customer and understand how they interact with your systems, how they interact with the business, how they interact with your employees, and optimize that experience. The goal is to make them happy, give them something simple, give them something easy, give them something frictionless, and make it reliable, right? So that create what does that do? That creates loyalty. Mm -hmm. And so that's one uh, facet that you have to start off before you look at the things you mentioned. The other things is, uh, is internally, what are the processes, the systems, the people, how are they oriented and organized to deliver customer value? Mm -hmm. What are you doing to optimize the employee experience internally to deliver with speed and agility, mm -hmm. right? We're talking about the, the quintessential things you want to create in the digital world are uh, speed, agility, and reliability because mm -hmm. the market is changing except for some of the industries you discussed. The, uh, the market is changing really rapidly. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so you need to be able to respond. Mm -hmm. And so before you even get started, you, you want to work your way through those things and not doing so is why 70% of those transformations that you outline fail mm -hmm. because your teams, your leadership, the teams, they're not clear on what you're trying to accomplish, what you're going to do, why it makes sense, and how, how it makes things better for customers and employees. And that lack of alignment and vision is critical to solve before you even move forward. So what you're talking about, this kind of user-centric approach, that really makes me think of design thinking and user-centric design, which, as you know, in tech product development, like it is... I wouldn't even say it's discipline. I would say it's a religion because like that's how you're supposed to build things. Whereas I find that in the traditional world, kind of customers are one of the stakeholders. And I always think, okay, yeah, but they're the ones that pay for everything. <laughs> so exactly. Aren't they, aren't they the most important one? I don't know. It, it, it is. Customers and also, I, I, I don't mean to beat the drum too, too hard, but employees are also a key stakeholder too, right? Because... Happy, productive, efficient employees do a great job. And when employees do a great job, customers feel it. And so you want to invest in making that employee experience rock solid as well. So interesting. So basically, your first point is don't look at the tech. Don't necessarily look at upgrading the team knowledge, but actually just track the customer journey and see what those customers want and probably also see how those customers are interacting with kind of digital products or interacting with things in general. Because for example, if it's super easy to pay your gas bill, but it's really, really difficult to pay your electricity bill, that's not gonna make, it's not gonna make sense. Um, equally, if your personal banking is seamless and your business banking is a nightmare, then it's not gonna make sense to the customer. Am I getting you that right? You got it, you hit the nail on the head. Excellent, I get an A. Um, <laughs> thank you. What's another impediment? We, we expounded on the customer experience and I think we drove that home. Um, what's another impediment to, to a digital transformation or operating a company in general? Um, biases. Mm -hmm. uh, employees, leaders, teams, they have biases. 
Mm-hmm. And one of the things I, I start with when we go through a transformation is drive this one home. Mm-hmm. Look, we've always done it that way is the death knell of very many companies. Yes. And so, you know, if you're going to drive this great new user experience and make it all simple and easy, you need to start looking at new ways potentially to do things. And it's going to push your comfort level. And what you're going to find from leaders is, hey, it took me 10 years of problems, Matt, to go get this thing working, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I finally got it and it's working. I don't want to change that because I don't want to go through the 10 years again. Well, the world has evolved and you may have to evolve. Mm -hmm. And so that's another kind of core part of what causes transformations to fail is those innate biases based on our experience. Well, interesting. In economics, that's called sunk cost fallacy, um, when essentially you already invested so much. You're thinking, well, I've invested like five million. OK, I kind of can't let go of that. But, you know, forgetting economics, I think we've all had those friendships or those relationships where it's like, well, it's not great, but I've already made so much effort for this thing to work. I'm just going to carry on pushing it, even though you're thinking, well, actually, would I make that investment today for like fresh no you wouldn't (laughs) okay well what i'd love to move on to is that your experience at amazon because you are one of the founders of amazon web services so um i think a lot of people everybody who's listened to this podcast know that amazon web services it's a thing it's a big thing it's a very big money generating thing but but speaking to a non-technical audience of smart business people Can you just quickly sum up what on earth is AWS? Sure. AWS is a platform for you to create and and host applications in the digital world, right? So, and I want to go back to the hallmarks of our discussion. It's simple, easy, and frictionless to get started to build your technology. Within a few minutes, you can spin up resources to host an application or build an application. And not at, from the bare bones of storage, networking, and compute on up to value-added, more business-oriented services like AI or analytics or and the like. And so they've built essentially a comprehensive platform for you to create and host and operate and manage applications that's easier than if you tried to do all that on your own in your own private data center. And that from the outset was our goal for AWS. You know, when I think about this, I always like to tell people kind of what happened before AWS, because then it's really easy to understand. So basically before cloud service, if you wanted to make an app, let's go back to our meditation app example. So you, you know, you're a great yoga teacher, you wanted to make an app, essentially you would need to have, as you said, your own data center and your own servers. And they're these big boxes that eat up a lot of electricity and you have to keep them cool and they take up space and they're really expensive. And essentially you would need to have this piece of technology that needed to, that was big and bulky and expensive and quite risky to maintain. And there'll be, there, you would need to have specialized knowledge of this thing. And and people to to keep people focused on multiple levels, people, you had to build staff to keep all that working. Yeah, it was like a very expensive, capricious pet, like for an extra time. It is. And it's a time sink, which Mm -hmm. is a big deal for companies. Mm -hmm. And so essentially the kind of people who were starting companies, A, they were very, very technically savvy. So if you're a yoga teacher with a meditation app idea, you're probably going to be locked out of that market. And uh, also it meant that you needed to have a lot of financing. You kind of couldn't really just launch something as an MVP, see what happens after three months and be like, oh, there's no market demand, like don't worry about it. And so what I find really interesting is that you can actually see the amount of innovation that happened, and especially the amount of consumer apps that came out basically after AWS said, hey, you don't need to, have your own big bulky thing. Now we are the ones that keep it and you can just rent space on ours. How does that explanation resonate with somebody who actually built AWS? 
It, 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 it's another key element of what you described, which is to get started with companies, you s- used to have to have a significant capital outlay. And we kind of disrupted that whole paradigm by saying, hey, you can just pay as you go. Mm-hmm. And by the way, even to incentivize you, we'll give you some ability to interact with the services free. You know, mm-hmm. no charge. Mm-hmm. Get started, play with it, get your experience. And and then if you want to go, we'll just pay, you just pay for what you use. So kind of like a drug dealer, you know, just try it. You're going <laughs> to like it, we're going to hook you. And then you're going to go and commit crimes to get more. <laughs> exactly. I don't know if Andy Jassy would like the drug dealer analogy, but it plays well. I think it's brilliant. And so what were you doing as one of the founders of AWS? So I created the database division. So, you know, our first product was SimpleDB. Mm-hmm. And so the premise of what we found in operating Amazon, and then my experience also at Microsoft on SQL Server, is we found that um, operating databases at scale is really, really hard. Mm-hmm. And it's hard because all the things you mentioned previously of stacking, racking gear, administering the second thing is um, overuse of technologies in the databases prevented it from scaling. You know, it's just too burdened. Um, and then the third thing is it just it wasn't simple, mm-hmm. right? And so people just wanted it to work. So we created a product that was a bare bones database. We wound up as you get bigger. Uh, you wind up using less and less of the bells and whistles in the database and simplifying because simple usually wins. And so, and so that, I just want to understand a database. When you're when you're talking about a database, just so our listeners could understand, is that literally just where you keep records? You know, if you're keeping yep. a database on your users or be like whatever user data, so their names, their last names, where they live, credit card numbers, that sort of thing, and the ability to search it. You know, in its simplest form, a relational database is like a spreadsheet on steroids. Mm-hmm. So I always, would this, tell me what you think of this explanation. I always think of Instagram. So Instagram obviously has all of our records, you know, if you're on it, um, I can't give up it. Um, so, you know, there's, there's Instagram that has all of our user records of who we are, but then it also has all of that data on, all of the stuff that you've liked and what you've commented and what you've shared and all of the interactions. So essentially it kind of holds this web of which webs I'm in. And then that's kind of the relational database because yes, you can keep you know names and addresses of people on the spreadsheet, but once those people start interacting with each other by sending each other messages, sharing each other's stuff, then that's not a spreadsheet. That's basically kind of like this- A graph. Thing. Yeah, I kind of think of it like in a rainforest, there are lianas that are moving in between the trees. <laughs> and that's kind of how I always picture a database. It's a it's it's a graph of relationships is what you've described. Okay, so there is actually a technical term. So this is what you're building. And you figured out that as things get more mature, actually, you don't need to use all the bells and whistles in a database. And why do you think that is? Um, because the bells and whistles take up a lot of resources and time and processing and just to maintain those winds up becoming an impediment to what the business really needs, which is a rapid, reliable experience. Mm -hmm. And then all the other paradigms that we've described about AWS were like, okay, we need to solve that problem. That's the core now we're even going to make it better by making it simple, easy to get started and the payment models we described, et cetera. And um, it disrupted the industry. It was the first mm-hmm. product. And then um, we learned, we saw, I won't go into all the different technical things that we did to solve it, but it was really hard. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we went out and figured out, well, there's multiple different types of databases that people want. And so we went on to add other other products on top of it because there's you know there's not really a Swiss Army knife, right? Mm-hmm. The yeah. things you you build things to solve different types of problems, and so you know that's what we went off and did. And so now that you are working in digital transformation yourself, so you've left Amazon and you're working with clients who are who want to go through these digital transformation projects, and so. 
in general, how do you find, like, what is the knowledge, what is the technical knowledge of the CEO that you're dealing with? Because, like, normally there would be a tech person first, but they have to, like, to talk to you. They need to understand what you're talking about. Um, well, I try to calibrate it. So it's mixed. So some are, like, they're not going to be deep technologists, and mm -hmm. that's actually okay and mm -hmm. probably good. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Uh, the typical tech CEO, is, uh, typical CEO has enough technical knowledge to kind of fundamentally understand things need to change. Mm -hmm. but what they're really driven about is the, the design oriented aspects we talked about, which is I've got to do better with customers. The market's changing. I need to drive adoption. I need mm -hmm. to create loyalty. And I know tech is a means to the end. And mm -hmm. that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're interested in, in speaking with people that can help them achieve those goals. But then why do you think innovation theater happens? Like I remember my company um, with help from the University of Chicago, we did this research report into how the largest companies in the world approach innovation, obviously digital transformation and, and you know, changes in user experience design, that was a huge part of what companies were doing. And some companies did really, really remarkable, interesting and cool things that really blew our minds. And some of them were just like, oh my God, clearly the CEO just read TechCrunch and like didn't even understand what it was, but it was like, I want one of them. And you know, there would be kind of these large companies that would kind of create or you know invest in something complete, like basically invest in total nonsense. Um, because it was the hottest thing in the tech press that particular month. And so I'm assuming, I mean, obviously you're not going to tell me who, who's done this, but I'm assuming you've seen this before. And so how do you deal with that situation where there is kind of a tech trend and it's hot and might even be super relevant for a client, but just not for the client that you're speaking to? What do you say to them? Uh, well, again, I start with what I talked about at the outset, like, what are you trying to achieve for customers and employees that design mm -hmm. thinking that you described? Mm -hmm. you know, technology is a means to the end. There's always going to be a new hot technology, right? Mm -hmm. And some of them have longevity and others don't, mm -hmm. but it's still just a means to the end. So mm -hmm. what are you trying to accomplish specifically? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What what will empower you to be able to create speed and agility in the business and make it reliable? And how are you going to empower customers? And then look at it objective, look at the technology objectively with that lens and say, hey, does this help me accomplish my goals measured by these KPIs, right? And that helps you kind of do the mush separator, if you will, of what to choose and what not. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is interesting because I know that a lot of people listening, they're MBAs and especially Chicago with MBAs, um, and that's a very, very studious group of people who just love learning things, even if they're completely irrelevant to what we actually need <laughs> to do our jobs, but you know, curiosity is a good thing. Um, but essentially to that person who is thinking, okay, maybe I'm a senior manager in a company going through a digital transformation. And then they're thinking, well, do I take a Python course or do I do programming? And like, what, what do I do? Are you saying to that person, actually, you know, maybe Python is not the most relevant thing for you to do, but actually understanding the user experience design, understanding how to interview users, that's more important. Am I well, depending on your role, right? So mm -hmm. it, it depends on your role. If you're in product management, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's about the, the, user experience and also what the user wants you need to be out there looking at the market talking to customers and figuring out that the customer needs an iphone before the iphone exists right yeah, how did they figure and that out <laughs> but they, they were very customer driven and went through the design paradigm that you described and they excelled at it mm -hmm. you know that they need to understand technology enough so that when techie guys like my myself and others come and talk to you, you you have an understanding and you're not just buried in acronyms, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So so have an understanding of what it is, uh, and then work together to mm -hmm. to accomplish what needs to happen. So like, look, let's use an example right now. AI is hot. Mm -hmm. Everybody thinks 
you know, chat GBT it is the Apple, there's an app for that paradigm mm -hmm. for AI. The iPhone didn't take off until there were apps. Mm -hmm. Well, now AI is taking off because of the marketing tool, and it's a mm -hmm. great marketing tool, chat GPT. It made AI more accessible, mm -hmm. more simple, more reliable. And so that captivated the minds of people about what I could do. Mm -hmm. What can I do? And so if I were a non-business person, I'd learn about how to work with AI mm -hmm. and, and how AI benefits, mm -hmm. benefits my job. I mean, there's, uh, I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm in lots of meetings and I'm just a terrible note taker. So I use Fireflies, mm -hmm. uh, fireflies.ai. It's AI that sits in the meeting and takes notes for mm -hmm. me. What a productivity increaser mm -hmm. that is mm -hmm. so learning how to interact and use things for your benefit and how they can improve the aspects of the business i'd focus there interesting because in that ai example that again that's going back to making things easy for people to use and then if people use it and it becomes easy for them to use it essentially industries change and i think that's uh, one of the problems that people who are really into crypto, that's what they say. They say that it's so difficult to actually buy crypto, have a crypto wallet. Like, you know, I'm speaking to somebody whose friend lost their crypto key and I'm working very hard on forgiving them. <laughs> and, and essentially, it's so hard and so difficult to manage that essentially even people who might want to dabble, they're not particularly into crypto, but they, you know, they've got like a few thousand dollars that they're just like, you know what, I'm going to stick it in there, see what happens. And I think I'm kind of in that, in that group. I couldn't do it myself. I literally had to have one of my developer friends. I was like, here's my money. Do something with it. I and agree. That's the key. That's literally what happened. <laughs> Oops. I, know. I know i keep on trying not to think of what the value would be now yeah. actually i know I... what the value would be now but i'm like oh friendship is more important you know when you're like what is it? i don't know <laughs> there there are many stories like that so i wouldn't find yourself being alone i know maybe we could have like a my friend lost my crypto key support group. <laughs> um, okay, so this, this is interesting. So essentially, all of this goes back to your original theme of understand the user, do whatever you can to make the user experience seamless and easy because the user is already in so many facets of life, is, easier to, is used to an easy and seamless experience. So if you don't provide that experience, essentially you're the one who's, you're the odd one out. That's, that's the core of what I would say, yes. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Matthew. It's been a pleasure having you. And for people who want to learn more and work with you on digital transformation projects, where could I tell them to find you? Sure. Uh, one is you can email me at um, matt, M-A-T-T dot domo, D-O-M-O at fifth, F-I-F-T-H-V-A-N, T A G E dot com, my company, Fifth Vantage. Or uh, I'm very responsive. My team and I are very responsive on LinkedIn. And so feel free to drop me a note and say, hey, I, I listen to the podcast and I'd like to, you know, learn more or get to know some more of these concepts more deeply and I will respond immediately. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for laughing at my jokes. It's very important. <laughs> Have a wonderful I love day. humor. It adds levity to situations, right? It's super important to not be too serious about things. Oh, we're not too serious around here. Thank you very much, Matthew. You're welcome. Have a great day. <laughs>